I with thought, braids. I thought she wasn't paying attention. I thought she was going to miss it. Okay. The flight to the ivory tower. Do you want to see the picture? Yes. Just as Atreyu passed through the somber gateway of Spook City and started on the exploration that was to end so dismally in a squalid backyard, Falcor the Luck Dragon was making an astonishing discovery. While searching tirelessly for his little friend and master, he had flown high into the clouds. On every side lay the sea, which was gradually growing calmer after the great storm that had churned it from top to bottom. Suddenly, Far in the distance, Falgor caught sight of something that puzzled and intrigued him. It was as though a beam of golden light were going on and off, on and off at regular intervals, and that beam of light seemed to point directly at him, Falgor. He flew toward it as fast as he could, and when he was directly over it, he saw that the light signal came from deep down in the water, perhaps from the bottom of the sea. Luck dragons, as we know, are creatures of air and fire. Not only is the liquid element alien to them, it is also their enemy. Water can extinguish them like a flame, or it can asphyxiate them, for they never stop breathing in air through their thousands of pearly scales. They feed on air and heat and require no other nourishment, but without air and heat they can only live a short time. Falcor didn't know what to do. He didn't even know what the strange blinking under the sea was or whether it had anything to do with Atreyu. But he didn't hesitate for long. He flew high into the sky, turned around and head down, pressing his legs close to his body, which he held stiff and straight as a telegraph pole. He plummeted. The water spouted like a fountain as he hit the sea at top speed. The shock was so great that he almost lost consciousness. But he forced himself to open his ruby red eyes. By then, the blinking beam was close, only a few body lengths ahead of him. Air bubbles were forming around his body, as in a saucepan full of water just before it boils. He felt that he was cooling and weakening. With his last strength, he dived still deeper, and then the source of the light was within reach. It was Orin, the gem. Luckily, the chain of the amulet had got caught on a coral branch growing out of the wall of an undersea chasm. Otherwise, the gem would have fallen into the bottomless depths. Falcor seized it and put the chain around his neck for fear of losing it, for he felt that he was about to faint. When he came to, he didn't know where he was, for, to his amazement, he was flying through the air. And when he looked down, there was the sea again. He was flying in a very definite direction and very fast, faster than would have seemed possible in his weakened condition. He tried to slow down, but soon found that his body would not obey him. An outside will far stronger than his own had taken possession of his body and was guiding it. That will came from Orin, the amulet suspended from a chain around his neck. The day was drawing to a close when at last Falcor sighted a beach in the distance. He couldn't see much of the country beyond. It seemed to be hidden by fog. But when he came closer, he saw that most of the land had been swallowed up by the nothing which hurt his eyes and gave him the feeling of being blind. At that point, Falgor would probably have turned back if he had been able to do as he wanted, but the mysterious power of the gem forced him to fly straight ahead, and soon he knew why. For in the midst of the endless nothing, he discovered a small island that was still holding out, an island covered with high gabled houses and crooked towers. Falgor had a strong suspicion whom he would find there, and from then on, it was not only the powerful will of the amulet that spurred him on, but his own as well. It was almost dark in the somber backyard where Atreyu lay beside the dead werewolf. The luck dragon was barely able to distinguish the boy's light-colored body from the monster's black coat. And the darker it grew, the more they looked like one body. Atreyu had long given up trying to break loose from the steel vice of the werewolf's jaws. Dazed with fear and weakness... He was back in the grass ocean. Before him stood the purple buffalo he had not killed. He called to the other children, his companions of the hunt, who by then had no doubt become real hunters. But no one answered. Only the giant buffalo stood there motionless, looking at him. 
Atreyu called Artax, his horse, but he didn't come, and his cheery neigh was nowhere to be heard. He called the childlike empress, but in vain. He wouldn't be able to tell her anything. He hadn't become a hunter, and he was no longer a messenger. He was a nobody. Atreyu had given up. But then he felt something else, the nothing. It must be very near, he thought. Again, he felt a terrible force of attraction. It made him dizzy. He sat up and groaning, tugged at his leg, but the fangs held fast. And in that, he was lucky. For if Gamork's jaws had not held him, Falgor would have come too late. As it was, Atreyu suddenly heard the luck dragon's bronze voice in the sky above him. Atreyu! Are you there, Atreyu? Falgor! Atreyu shouted. And then he cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, Falgor! Falgor, I'm here! Help me, I'm here! And then he saw Falgor's white body darting like a living streak of lightning through the square of darkening sky. Far away at first, then closer. Atreyu kept shouting, and Falgor answered in his bell-like voice. Then at last, the dragon in the skies caught sight of the boy down below, no bigger than a bright speck in a dark hole. <clears throat> Falgor prepared for a landing, but the backyard was small. There was hardly any light left, and the dragon brushed against one of the high gabled houses. The roof collapsed with a roar. Dragon, the Falgor felt an agonizing pain. The sharp edge of the roof had cut deep into his body. This wasn't one of his usual graceful landings. He came tumbling down on the grimy wet pavement next to Atreyu and the dead Gamork. He shook himself, sneezed like a dog coming out of the water and said, At last! So this is where you are! Oh well, I seem to have got here on time! Atreyu said nothing. He threw his arms around Falcor's neck and buried his face in the dragon's silvery white mane. Come, said Falcor, climb on my back. We have no time to lose. Atreyu only shook his head, and then Falcor saw that Atreyu's leg was imprisoned in the werewolf's jaws. Don't worry, he said, rolling his ruby red eyeballs. We'll fix that in a jiffy. He set to with both paws, trying to pry Gmork's teeth apart. They didn't budge by a hair breath. Falcor heaved and panted. It was no use. Most likely he would never have set his young friend free if luck hadn't come to his help. But luck dragons, as we know, are lucky, and so are those they are fond of. When Falgor stopped to rest, he bent over Gamork's head to get a better look at it in the dark, and it so happened that the childlike empress's amulet, which was hanging from the chain on the dragon's neck, touched the werewolf's forehead. Instantly, the jaws opened, releasing Atreyu's leg. Hey, cried Falgor, what do you think of that? There was no answer from Atreyu. What's wrong, cried Falgor. Atreyu, where are you? He groped in the darkness for his friend, but Atreyu wasn't there. That's very loud. And while the dragon was trying to pierce the darkness with his glowing red eyes, he himself felt the pool that had snatched Atreyu away from him. The nothing was coming too close for comfort, but Arin protected the luck dragon from the pool. Atreyu was free from the werewolf's jaws, but not from the pull of the nothing. He tried to fight it, to kick, to push, but his limbs no longer obeyed him. A few feet more and he would have been lost forever. But in that moment, quick as lightning, Falcor grabbed him by his long blue-black hair and carried him up into the night-black sky. The clock in the belfry struck nine. Mom, well, well this seems to be a stick man. Beautiful. I love it. Neither Atreyu nor Falcor, Falcor could say later how long they had flown through the impenetrable darkness. Had it been only one night? Perhaps time had stopped for them and they were hovering motionless in the limitless blackness. It was the longest night Atreyu had ever known. And the same was true for Falcor, who was much older. But even the longest and darkest of nights passes sooner or later. 
and when the pale dawn came, they glimpsed the ivory tower on the horizon. Here it seems necessary to pause for a moment and explain a special feature of fantastic in geography. Continents and oceans, mountains and watercourses have no fixed locations as in the real world. Thus, it would be quite impossible to draw a map of Fantastica. In Fantastica, you can never be sure in advance what will be next to what. Even the directions, north, south, east, and west, change from one part of the country to another. And the same goes for summer and winter, day and night. You can step out of a blazing hot desert straight into snowfields. In Fantastica, there are no measurable distances, so that near and far don't at all mean what they do in the real world. They vary with the traveler's wishes and state of mind. Since Fantastica has no boundaries, its center can be anywhere. It all depends on who is trying to reach the center. And the innermost center of Fantastica is the ivory tower. To his surprise, Atreyu found himself sitting on the luck dragon's back. He couldn't remember how he had got there. All he remembered was that Falcor had pulled him up by the hair. Feeling cold, he gathered in his cloak, which was fluttering behind him. And then he saw that it was gray. It had lost its color, and so had his skin and hair. And Falgor, as Treyu discovered in the rising light, was no better off. The dragon looked unreal, more like a swath of gray mist than anything else. They had both come too close to the nothing. Atreyu, my little master, the dragon said softly, does your wound hurt very badly? About his own wound, he said nothing. No, said Atreyu. I don't feel anything anymore. Have you a fever? No, Falcor. I don't think so. Why do you ask? I can feel you trembling, said the dragon. What in the world can make Atreyu tremble now? After a short silence, Atreyu said, We'll be there soon, and then I'll have to tell the childlike empress that nothing can save her. That's harder than anything else I've ever had to do. Yes, said Falcor even more softly. That's true. They flew in silence, drawing steadily nearer to the ivory tower. After a while, the dragon spoke again. Have you seen her, Atreyu? Who? The childlike empress, or rather, the golden-eyed commander of wishes, because that's how you must address her when you come into her presence. No, I've never seen her. I have. That was long ago. Your great-grandfather must have been a little boy at the time, and I was a young cloud snapper with a head full of foolishness. One night I saw the moon shining so big and round and I tried to grab it out of the sky. When I finally gave up, I dropped with exhaustion and landed near the ivory tower. That night the Magnolia Pavilion had opened its petals wide and the childlike empress was sitting right in the middle of it. She cast a glance at me, just one short glance, but I hardly know how to put it. That glance made a new dragon of me. What does she look like? Like a little girl. But she's much older than the oldest inhabitants of Fantastica. Or rather, she's ageless. Yes, said Atreyu. But now she's deathly sick. How can I tell her that there's no hope? Don't try to mislead her. She can't be fooled. Tell her the truth. But suppose it kills her. I don't think it will work out that way, said Falcor. You wouldn't, said Atreyu, because you're a luck dragon. For a long while, nothing was said. When at last they spoke together for the third time, it was Atreyu who broke the silence. Falcor, he said, I'd like to ask you one more thing. Fire away. Who is she? What do you mean? Aurin has power over all the inhabitants of Fantastica, the creatures of both light and dark. It also has power over you and me, and yet the childlike empress never exerts power. It's as if she weren't there, and yet she is, in everything, 
Is she like us? No, said Falcor. She is not like us. She's not a creature of Fantastica. We all exist because she exists. But she's of a different kind. Then is she... Atreyu hesitated. Is she human? No, said Falcor. She's not human. Well then... And Atreyu repeated his question. Who is she? After a long silence, Falcor answered, No one in Fantastica knows. No one can know. That's the deepest secret of our world. I once heard a wise man say that if anyone were to know the whole answer, he would cease to exist. I don't know what he meant. That's all I can tell you. And now, said Atreyu, she'll die. And we'll die with her and we'll never know her secret. This time Falcor made no answer, but a smile played around the corners of his leonine mouth, as though to say, nothing of the kind will happen. After that, they spoke no more. A little later, we'll find out. A little later, they flew over the outer edges of the labyrinth, the maze of flower beds, hedges, and winding paths that surrounded the ivy ta ivory tower on all sides. To their horror, they saw that there, too, the nothing had been at work. True, it had touched only small spots in the labyrinth, but those spots were all about. The once bright-colored flower beds and shrubbery in between were now gray and withered. The branches of once graceful little trees were gnarled and bare. The green had gone out of the meadows, and a faint smell of rot and mold rose up to the newcomers. The only colors left were those of swollen giant mushrooms and of garish, poisonous-looking blooms that suggested nothing so much as the figments of a maddened brain. Enfeebled and trembling, the innermost heart of Fantastica was still resisting the inexorable encroachment of the nothing. The ivory tower at the center still shimmered pure, immaculately white. Ordinarily, flying messengers landed on one of the lower terraces, but Falcor reasoned that since neither he nor Atreyu had the strength to climb the long spiraling street leading to the top of the tower, and since time was of the essence, the regulations and rules of etiquette could reasonably be ignored. He therefore decided on an emergency landing. Swooping down, swooping down over the ivory buttresses, bridges, and balustrades, he located, just in time, the uppermost end of the spiraling high street, which lay just outside the palace grounds. Plummeting to the roadway, he went into a skid, made several complete turns, and finally came to a stop, tail first. Atreyu, who had been clinging with both arms to Falcor's neck, sat up and looked around. He had expected some sort of reception, or at least a detachment of palace guards to challenge them, but far and wide there was no one to be seen. All the life seemed to have gone out of the gleaming white buildings round about. They've all fled, he thought. They've left the childlike empress alone. Or she's already... Atreyu, Falcor whispered. You must give the gem back to her. Falcor removed the golden chain from his neck. It fell to the ground. Atreyu jumped down off Falcor's back and fell. He had forgotten his wound. He reached for the glory and put the chain around his neck. Then... Leaning on the dragon, he rose painfully to his feet. Falcor, he said, where must I go? But the luck dragon made no answer. He lay as though dead. The street ended in front of an enormous, intricately carved gate which led through a high white wall. The gate was open. Atreyu hobbled through it and came to a broad, gleaming white stairway that seemed to end in the sky. He began to climb. Now and then he stopped to rest. Drops of his blood left a trail behind him. At length, the stairway ended. Ahead of him lay a long gallery. He staggered ahead, clinging to, clinging to the balustrade for support. Next, he came to a courtyard that seemed to be full of waterfalls and fountains. But by then, he couldn't be sure of what he was seeking. He struggled forward as in a dream. He came to a second, smaller gate. Then there was a long, narrow stairway which took him to a garden where everything 
Trees, flowers, and animals was carved from ivory. Crawling on all fours, he crossed several arched bridges without railings, which led to a third gate, the smallest of all. He dragged himself through on his belly and, slowly raising his eyes, saw a dome-shaped hall of gleaming white ivory, and on top of it, the Magnolia Pavilion. There was no path or stairway leading up to it. Atreyu buried his head in his hands. No one who reaches or has reached that pavilion can say how he got there. The last stretch of the way must come to him as a gift. Suddenly, Atreyu was in the doorway. He went in and found himself face to face with the golden-eyed commander of wishes. She was sitting propped on many cushions on a soft round couch at the center of the great round blossom. She was looking straight at him. She seemed infinitely frail and delicate. Atreyu could see how ill she was by the pallor of her face, which seemed almost transparent. Her almond-shaped eyes, the color of dark gold, were serene and untroubled. She smiled. Her small, slight body was wrapped in an ample silken gown which gleamed so white that the magnolia petals seemed dark beside it. She looked like an indescribably beautiful little girl of no more than ten, but her long, smoothly combed hair which hung down over her shoulders was as white as snow. Bastion gave a start. Something incredible had happened. Thus far, he had been able to visualize every incident of the never-ending story. Some of them, it couldn't be denied, were very strange, but they could somehow be explained. He had formed a clear picture of Atreyu riding on the luck dragon, of the labyrinth and the ivory tower. These pictures, however, had existed only in his imagination. But when he came to the Magnolia Pavilion, he saw the face of the childlike empress, if only for a fraction of a second, for the space of a lightning flash. And not only in his thoughts, but with his eyes. It wasn't his imagination. Of that, Bastion was sure. He'd even seen the details that were not mentioned in the description. I just realized something. Such as her eyebrows, two fine lines that might have been drawn with India ink, arching over her golden eyes, or her strangely elongated earlobes, or the way her head tilted on her slender neck. Bastion knew that he had never in all his life seen anything so beautiful as this face. And in that same moment, he knew her name, Moonchild. Yes, beyond a doubt, that was her name. And Moonchild had looked at him at him, Bastion Balthazar Bucks. She had looked at him with an expression that he could not interpret. Had she been too taken by surprise? Had there been a plea in that look or longing? Or what could it be? He tried to remember Moonchild's eyes, but was no longer able to. He was sure of only one thing, that her glance had passed through his eyes and down into his heart. He could still feel the burning trail it had left behind. That glance, he felt, was embedded in his heart, and there it glittered like a mysterious jewel. And in a strange and wonderful way, it hurt. Even if Bastion had wanted to, he couldn't have defended himself against this thing that had happened to him. However, he didn't want to. Oh, no. Not for anything in the world would he have parted with that jewel. All he wanted was to go on reading, to see Moonchild again, to be with her. It never occurred to him that he was getting into the most unusual and perhaps the most dangerous of adventures. But even if he'd known this, he wouldn't have dreamed of shutting the book. With a trembling forefinger, he found his place and went on reading. The clock in the belfry struck ten.